professor yesterday, but you did a uh, brief intro since you weren't here yesterday. Um, I teach at Life Pacific University in Virginia. We're extension campus for Life Pacific University. Uh, the main campus is in California. Uh, they have several bachelor's degrees available in California. Um, we do uh, what's called a two plus two program in Virginia, which is basically two years in on campus uh, where you get an associate's degree. And then the second two years, you go off into a residency, similar to internship or apprenticing, uh, where you go to a church and you work at that church and finish your bachelor's degree while you're working at that church. And so, uh, so that's what we do in the at the Virginia campus, we have residencies all over um, all over the United States. We actually have a residency in Ponca City, and some students of mine who are at the Ponca City Church might be coming to sit in sometime this week um, just to hang out and see me because I haven't seen them in a while. So um, anyway, so that's what I do. Um, married, have two kids, love the Bible, love all things nerdy. Uh, so Marvel, Star Wars, all of that stuff. Big, big fan. My, my phone is uh, the Spider phone. I've got a Spider-Man background on my phone. I bought a red phone just so I could have a Spider-Man phone. Uh, so I'm a big nerd. Uh, but uh, what's that? Yeah, and so the tattoo on the arm is from uh, G.I. Joe. Yeah, and so the two ninjas in G.I. Joe both have this tattoo. It's come, it comes from the uh, Arashikage clan in G.I. Joe. And uh, when I was a kid, I would draw this on my arm. Uh, like I'd go to kindergarten and I'd draw this on my arm and I'd get home and my mom would wash it off my arm. And then I'd go back to the next day and draw it on my arm again. <laughs> I'd get home and she'd wash it off. And so I've literally wanted this since I was five. Um, so uh, later in life, um, you've probably noticed at least at this point that I have kind of a loud voice. Um, I've always sort of had this loud voice that just sort of like booms and like carries for forever and ever and ever. And uh, e even when I was a kid, I obviously didn't have this, you know, not, not a five-year-old walking around talking like this, you know, but but I, my voice carried when I was a kid. So like, I'd be in the back of the bus and I'd be talking and I'd get in trouble for talking, but none of the people around me would get in trouble because the bus driver could hear me, but he couldn't hear them, right? And so I just sort of, uh, that sort of started to filter into my personality uh, where I would, um, you know, in the same way that I would try to talk quieter so that I wasn't upsetting people or getting in trouble, I started to kind of like silence myself, like my personality, uh, so that it wouldn't upset people, right? Because um, I'm sort of a loud person, right? So I try to like hold that back a little bit. And, uh, and at some point uh, in my early 20s, God really confronted me on that and basically said, I created you to be who you are, and uh, when you're not being that, you're disrespecting my decisions. Uh, and so if you're trying to stop what I've made you to be, um, then that's disrespectful. And, uh, and so I got this as a reminder that I should be who God created me to be, not who other people are comfortable with, uh, because I've wanted this since I was five. Right? This is like uniquely me. It looks like a brick wall. I get all sorts of weird questions about it. Uh, I have some friends that are like really into wrestling, and so they give me a hard time, because if you read the skin and not the ink, it looks like it says HHH or Triple H. Triple H is a wrestler. And so I have my friends that are like, yeah, yeah, you're just a really big Triple H fan. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah sure, sure, yeah. Um, so, uh, so I get all sorts of like comments about it. And, you know, to most people, it's just weird. But I have this weird red thing on my arm. But to me, it's a reminder that, you know, I should be who God created me to be and not be what's going to make other people comfortable. So, um, so that's uh, to answer that question. Uh, I figured it would come up at some point. You know, if I'm wearing t-shirts and people see this, at some point someone's going to say, "What's up with the brick wall on your arm?" I right? figured it was GI Joe, but I just wanted to. Look yeah. Like, um, Usually, people don't recognize it as GI Joe uh, because, well, it's GI Joe's not really super popular anymore, and uh, usually it's just a handful of people from my generation who. Uh, remember that mark from Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow, um, but uh, but yeah. So every now and then I run into people and they're like, "Joe, yeah, Joe, yeah." I've met like two people in my life that also have this tattoo, and we're like instantly best friends, right? Just like immediately we're like, "Yeah, yeah, best friends." Uh, yeah, it's great. So so anyway, um, big big nerd. Love the Bible. Love talking about the Bible. Love questions about the Bible. Um, 
As I said yesterday, I've got content for our, our time together, but I'm very, very okay with just dumping the content and going with questions. Uh, so if you have more questions, um, you know, one of the things uh, that I'm um, very motivated by is I've seen over the past 10 years that I've been teaching, I've seen a lot of students who have been sort of um, uh, ignored when it comes to their questions. I've had students said, uh, students that have told me uh, that their youth pastor told them, uh, you know, just put that question in your God box, right? Um, and that God box is going to explode one day, and it's not going to be a pleasant experience, right? So uh, for me, like, I want to take your questions seriously. Uh, if I don't know the answer for them, we can find the answer. There's someone somewhere that knows the answer, so we can figure that out. Um, so I'm fully comfortable, regardless of whether it's on topic or off topic, just like yesterday, right? Like, this isn't really on topic, but hey, what about this thing, right? Uh, like, I'm totally fine with that and just ditching what we're talking about and moving into, into the question, okay? Because um, that's a big deal to me, and I think that's a big deal for your generation. There's a lot of people with all this deconstruction stuff going on uh, that their questions haven't been taken seriously, and so they leave the church because no one in the church has ever taken those questions seriously, right? So I want to I take those questions seriously. So, um, so moving forward, like we talked about yesterday with this book, uh, it basically organizes the story of Scripture into acts as though it is a play. That's what's called the drama of Scripture. So uh, taking the entire story of Scripture and organizing it like a play. Uh, act 1 was creation. Act 2 is rebellion. And this is the fall. We talked about this briefly yesterday. That um, Adam and Eve have this opportunity to choose to do what God wants them to do or to do what they want to do. And they choose to do what they want to do. Right? And as a result, bad things happen. So up to this point in the story, we have our central characters, God and humans. We have the setting, created order that God speaks into existence. The conflict arises in that the, uh, the humans decide to do what they want to do as opposed to what God wants to do. And this breaks what we would call the shalom of the world that God has made. Shalom is a Hebrew term for peace. Uh, and uh, if in any other language related to Hebrew, like Arabic or Farsi or any of those languages, um, that same word, sal uh, salam, right? If you've ever seen in a movie somebody say, ah, salam alaikum, right? It's like, how is your peace? That salam in there is the same thing as shalom, right? Jerusalem, or if you've ever seen a town named Salem, right? All of those come from that same word. And the idea there is completeness. The idea there is things are the way that they should be. Things are the way that God wants them to be. And then when we decide to do something else, that shalom is broken. Things aren't the way that they should be anymore, right? There's a world religion scholar named Stephen Prothero who uh, says that the only thing that all world religions agree on is that something is wrong. Right? Every world religion agrees that there's something wrong in the world. Right? I can't eat cookies all day and look like Brad Pitt. Right? There's something wrong with the world. Right? Uh, and so all world religions agree on that. They don't agree on what is wrong. Right? Uh, Buddhists say that it's uh, attachment that leads to suffering, whereas Christians say it's the fall. Right? So there's different uh, ideas about what this problem is, but everybody agrees that there's a problem. So in Christianity, the problem is that this shalom has been fractured because we've decided to do what we want to do, not what God wants us to do, right? And that is consistent throughout the narrative of Scripture. So how the world goes wrong, we talked about this a little bit yesterday. Uh, Adam and Eve uh, are presented with a choice, and so they decide, uh, they get to decide whether they want to do what God wants them to do. They have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they have the tree of life. Tree of Life, God is permitting them to eat of the Tree of Life, and it seems in the narrative that if they eat of the Tree of Life, then they can live forever based on eating from the Tree of Life. Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil, they are not to eat from this tree. To eat from this tree is to seize autonomy. Uh, what that means is self-rule. Uh, autonomy literally comes from two Greek words, which means, uh, which means self and law. 
right? And that means uh, making the rules yourself, being in control of things yourself. And so uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's not saying we should have knowledge. There's a lot of people that will look at this passage and say, yeah, this is Christianity. Christianity is anti-science. It's anti-knowledge. Uh, because in the garden, there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's not really what's happening in the story. What's happening in the story is the right to decide what is good and evil. That's really what Adam and Eve are choosing here. They're, they're choosing their right to decide what is good and evil, as opposed to God's right to decide what is good and evil. Uh, and so it's not about knowledge, right? Christianity is a knowledge tradition. Judaism is a knowledge tradition. Honestly, if you look at the history of science, science exists because of Christianity. Uh, you know, if, if it weren't for the doctrine of creation, the fact that we believe that the world was created in an orderly manner, created with a purpose, then we wouldn't expect that scientific tests would even work, right? We would expect that the world's just sort of chaotic and things just kind of happen, right? We wouldn't expect that we would be able to, like, actually do something and get predictable results. By eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve rebel against God's design. And, uh, and so, you know, my background image here, I try to give images in all of my PowerPoints. Background image here is an angel driving Adam and Eve out of the garden, right? So they're, they're being driven out of the garden uh, because of their, their decision. When they are uh, driven out of the garden, when they fall, when that happens, they have a broken relationship with one another. Uh, we can see this immediately when... The fall occurs, and God shows up to talk to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. God basically says, where are you? And Adam is, you know, kind of freaking out, and, uh, and God's like, well, what's going on here? You know, Adam says, we hid because we were naked. God says, who told you that you were naked? And uh, Adam says, well, the woman that you gave me, right? <laughs> Uh, like Adam's immediate response is to shift the blame to the woman and to God, right? There are only like four characters in the story thus far, God, Adam, Eve, and the serpent. And so Adam blames the two people who are not at fault, right? <laughs> he blames God and, and Eve. And then Eve's not much better, right? Uh, God turns to Eve and says, what have you done? And Eve says, well, the serpent, right? And so she shifts blame. She doesn't take ownership over her situation, right? And so in this, we see that they have broken relationship with one another, right? They're, they're not even on the same page in their conversation with God. Um, they, they don't even present a united front here in their conversation with God. They're blaming each other. Uh, they're, they are not in a healthy relationship at this point. Right? And so the fall leads to uh, this uh, break in the relationship. And this break in the relationship for the rest of Genesis 4 to Genesis 11, which is right up to the Tower of Babel prior to the, con uh, to the uh, discussion of Abraham. Abraham starts in Genesis 12. Uh, the rest of this Genesis 4 to Genesis 11 will trace out this conflict. will we'll show how... Humanity is, is no longer at peace with itself. We don't even get along with each other. Uh, immediately, Adam and Eve have children. And what do their first children do? Cain and Abel. Uh, yeah. Cain kills Abel. Right? And you're like, we didn't even get like one generation into this <laughs> without there being murder. Right? Uh, this is a big deal. Right? There's also a broken relationship with God. In the fall, not only are Adam and Eve not able to relate to one another in a healthy way, they're not able to relate to God in a healthy way. They're hiding from God in the garden. Uh, they're ashamed of their nakedness, which seems to indicate that they were not ashamed of their nakedness prior, right? Which is kind of weird, right? So <laughs> they're just like walking around in the garden totally naked and completely okay with it. Uh, but at this point, they're, they're afraid of God. The one that they've spent time with, the one that they've walked with in the garden, uh, the one that they should have a good relationship with, they're afraid of him. Uh, and so uh, they're alienated from God. And then they're also alienated from creation itself. Uh, 
there's a specific, you know, and you, you see this in the, the artwork back here that you have uh, Cain and Abel with Eve, and you have Adam, you know, probably Adam doesn't have a shovel at this point, right? But, you know, he's got a shovel in the painting. Uh, <laughs> uh, that Adam's like working the ground. Well, in the curse, in Genesis 3, uh, God says that he will multiply the, child, uh, the pain of childbirth for Eve, and that the toil that Adam will have will be greater when he works the ground. And so everything that they do is now harder. Um, having children and raising children is harder. Uh, growing plants and uh, cultivating, raising, and harvesting plants is harder. Everything is harder because there's now uh, a conflict between them and creation itself. And so the fall is not just like they sinned and that needs to be solved. It really is, they no longer have proper relationship with one another, they no longer have proper relationship with God, and they no longer have proper relationship with creation. So this is much larger than just like, oops, we need to fix that, right? There's a break at every level of relationship. And we still see this today, right? Like creation, we had the wasp in here yesterday, or the mud dauber or whatever, right? He's still actually, his dead body's like right here, right? Uh, you know, creation is still not, like, friendly to us, right? <laughs> I can't go to cuddle tigers, right? As much as I want to, I can't go, like, cuddle tigers. It's not going to work out for me. Um, creation is still not at peace with us. And we're still not at peace with one another. I mean, you just, like, turn on the news for five seconds, and we're not at peace with one another, right? Um, and so this is still an issue. And we're still in broken relationship with God, to varying degrees, right? Uh, you know, the people that we interact with on a regular basis, like, uh, you know, when we get to the New Testament, Paul explicitly says in Corinthians that God is making his appeal through us to others that they would be reconciled to God, right? And so as we interact with other people, we are the, uh, the ones who are making the appeal, God making the appeal through us that those people will be reconciled with God. If memory serves, that's 2 Corinthians 5. Um, that God is making that appeal through us. And so this is still happening. Broken relationship with one another, broken relationship with God, broken relationship with creation. God, being merciful, responds to this. And this is, again, one of those places where we tend to read over this without thinking about um, what this really means for God's character. I don't know about you, but if I were in God's shoes... I probably would have wiped the slate clean and started over, right? Like, okay, we're going to do this again, but next time it's going to be better, right? And they're not going to screw it up next time, right? Uh, no, that's not what he does. Uh, God's creation is out of grace because he doesn't need to create. Uh, God's communication with Adam and Eve is out of grace because he doesn't need to interact with them. And then when they fall, is it God under any obligation whatsoever to continue to communicate with them? No. And so the fact that God even reaches out to them when they fall is grace. God is being gracious to them in this, right? Um, and he continues to be gracious to them and to their descendants and all the way down to us, right? So God takes the initiative. God seeks them out to see what happens. God provides a covering. The first sacrifice in Scripture, in fact, is when uh, God provides an animal covering for them to clothe their nakedness. Because they, you know, they're ashamed of their nakedness. And he's like, okay, well, let's fix this. And so he takes an animal and he clothes them. So he creates the first sacrifice. And this protects Adam and Eve. And then, in the curse, in the place in Scripture where he specifically says, I'll multiply your chain, your, your chain, your pain in childbirth, uh, your your pain, chain in childbirth, right? Chain, pain in childbirth, right? Not the other way around. And then says to Adam that he'll multiply um, the difficulty of the ground, right? In that exact same passage, he says that he'll put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, and the seed of the serpent will bruise. Uh, the seed of the woman, and the, the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head, right? So you have this weird passage. This is in Genesis 3.15. And uh, 
this promise, this is called the uh, uh, Proto-Evangelion, which is a fancy way of saying first gospel. So, you have this parallel in Genesis 3.15 of you will bruise her and he or she will crush. And so in Genesis 3.15, this, uh, you have this parallel statement of bruising and crushing or crushing and crushing or something like that. Well, this is Hebrew, uh, in case you wanted to see some Hebrew today, there's Hebrew for you. Uh, and this is Hebrew of the passage. Uh, and so there's enmity between um, uh, the seed and the seed. That's what these two words are. Uh, and in, in the Greek translation of this, we talked about this a little bit yesterday um, with uh, Isaiah, right? The, um, how Isaiah chooses uh, virgin as opposed to just choosing young woman. Uh, uh, that, uh, or rather, uh, Matthew, sorry. The, the Greek translation of Isaiah chooses that. Um, same thing happens here in Genesis 3.15. Um, the way that this could read in Hebrew, this word right here, who in Hebrew, um, could be he or she. That's why in the English translation I have there, I have he slash she will crush. Because the Hebrew here could be either one. It could be he or she. Um, but in Greek, you can't have it ambiguous. You have to make the choice of one versus the other. In Hebrew, you could be ambiguous. In Hebrew, who could be one or the other. Greek, though, you can't do that. So Greek has to make a decision. So when they translate this into Greek, they say he. Uh, and so he is the one who is willing to do this, right? Now, interesting fact, this is Latin, uh, and Latin says she. <laughs> and so this is one of the reasons why, if you know anything about Catholicism, they're uh, really big fans of Mary, right? And uh, the Latin translation is what has dominated in Catholicism, and one of the reasons that they're really big fans of Mary is because of this passage, that Mary is the one who is going to triumph over the serpent, not Jesus. Um, Anyway, so that's just like a little side note. But the Greek translation here in 315, this is what we know about this in this Greek translation towards the time of Jesus, fast forwarding a whole lot, right? Is that when they read this passage, they say there's something here that is beyond just the descendant of this woman. There is something more here that is beyond just a person that's going to come from this woman. This person is going to give us the final victory, right? This person is going to undo all of these things, right? And this is right at the very beginning in Genesis 3.15. This is one of the reasons why when we get to Isaiah 7, one of the reasons why they translate this as virgin is because when you talk about the seed of a woman, that kind of has to be a virgin birth, Right? It's not the seed of the man, it's the seed of the woman. So if there's the seed of the woman, that kind of has to be a virgin birth. And so when they make this translation decision, they've already translated Genesis 3.15, and so they're like, well, this person that Isaiah is talking about is the same person that Genesis was talking about. Right? This, this person born of a virgin is the seed of the woman. Right? And that's Jesus. Right? So it's important to see here that God takes this initiative in grace and sets up at the very beginning, immediately after the fall, sets up what he plans to do to fix everything. Right? That this isn't like, we shouldn't, again, we shouldn't view the Old Testament as just sort of this like plan A and Jesus' plan B and like let's just focus on Jesus and not worry about what happened in the Old Testament. Right? That's not how we should view this. God from the outset has Jesus in mind, right? God at the outset intervenes at the fall and decides what he's going to do with people, decides how he's going to redeem people, right? Um, and so this is how we should read the fall. So uh, where do we go from here? Uh, human beings in an act of uh, rebellion. Uh, they reject God's design for their lives. As a result, sin, suffering, and ruin are entered uh, into the world. Uh, but even in this moment, we see God in his plan of redemption. He cares for Adam and Eve, covers them, provides a sacrifice for them, and promises a future deliverer. So God's story of redemption at this point 
is his gracious work to undo all that was lost in the fall. Through the promised Savior, he will restore his creation, come into right relationship with his people, and return us to the space where we rule and reign alongside him. So, as I did yesterday, we're going to watch another video about the Bible Project. This does a really great job of illustrating uh, this, uh, this idea. So in the Bible, the ideas of heaven and earth are ways of talking about God's space and our space. So I understand our space really well. We live here. There's trees, rivers, mountains. But my understanding of God's space gets a little fuzzy. And what we do get in the Bible are images trying to help us grasp God's space, which is basically inconceivable to us. So these are two very different types of spaces. Yes, they're, they're different in their nature, but here's what's really interesting. is that In the Bible, these are not always separate spaces. So think of heaven and earth as like different dimensions that can overlap in the same exact space. So we talk a lot about going to heaven after we die, but... This idea of heaven and earth overlapping, we don't talk a lot about that. Which is kind of crazy, because the union of heaven and earth is what the story of the Bible is all about. How they were once fully united and then driven apart, and about how God is bringing them back together once again. So let's go back to the beginning, where heaven and earth, they're completely overlapping. Yeah, this is what uh, the Bible's description of the Garden of Eden is all about. It's a place where God and humanity dwell together perfectly, no separation, and, and humans then partner with God in building a flourishing, beautiful world and so on. But as humans, we wanted to do things a different way. We wanted God out, and we wanted to create a world apart from Him. Yeah, so we have these two spaces now. And the Bible actually uses lots of different kinds of words and phrases to refer to these two spaces to make a clear distinction. So you said that these spaces can overlap, though. So explain how that works. Yeah, this is where we have to start talking about temples. Because in the biblical world, you experience God's presence by going to a temple. That's where heaven and earth uh, overlap. Now, there are two types of temples described in the Bible. One is a tabernacle, basically a tent that was built by Moses. And the other was this massive building made by Solomon. And these temples were decorated with fruit trees and flowers and images of angels and all kinds of gold and jewels and so on. And these are designed to make you feel like you're going back to the garden. And at the center of the temple was a place called the Holy of Holies, which was like the hot spot of God's presence. Now we can go and be with God again. But not so fast, because the temple also creates a problem. So God's space is full of his presence and goodness and justice and beauty, but human space is full of sin and injustice and the ugliness that results. So how do these spaces overlap if they're so different and they're in conflict with each other? This was resolved through animal sacrifice. Yeah, that's kind of weird. What do animal sacrifices have to do with this? Yeah, the, the idea is this. Animal sacrifices, somehow they absorb the sin when the animal dies in your place. And it creates a clean space, so to speak, where you are now free to enter into the temple and be in God's presence. Okay, so if I'm an Israelite and I live in Jerusalem, I might be able to be in God's presence. But you said the story of the Bible is all of heaven and earth reuniting. Right, so we have to keep going in the story where we come to Jesus in the New Testament. And in the Gospel of John, we hear this claim that God became human in Jesus and made his dwelling among us. Now this word dwelling is really curious. It, literally it means he set up a tabernacle among us. And so what John is claiming right here is that Jesus is a temple. He is now the place where heaven and earth overlap. What's interesting about Jesus is that he isn't staying in this safe, clean space. He's running around hanging out with sinners. He's healing people of their sicknesses, and forgiving people of their sins. He's basically creating little pockets of heaven where people can be in God's presence, but he's doing it out there in the middle of the world of sin and death. And he keeps telling everyone that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he even told his followers to pray regularly that God's kingdom come and that his will be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. But a lot of people are threatened by Jesus and they kill him, which seems to spoil this whole plan to reunite heaven and earth. 
But we, we have to go back to a scene earlier on in Jesus' story where John the Baptist saw Jesus and said, Behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus isn't just talked about as being a temple. He's also talked about as being the temple sacrifice. Yeah, so, so the cross is now the place where Jesus absorbs sin to create a clean space that is not limited like animal sacrifices. Jesus' sacrifice has the power to keep spreading and spreading and reuniting more and more of heaven and earth. And this is all really great, but it leaves one big question in my mind, which is, what happens when I die? Don't I just fly over to God's space to be with Jesus? Yeah, so a few times in the New Testament we learn that Christians will be with Jesus in heaven after they die, but that is not the focus of the Bible story. The focus is on how heaven and earth are being reunited through Jesus and will be completely brought together one day when he returns. So in the book of Revelation we get this beautiful image of the Garden of Eden, now in the form of a city, coming to end the age of sin and death by redeeming all of human history in a renewed creation. And God's space and human space completely overlap once again. We believe the best way to understand the Bible is to look at its overall narrative. So we're going to do this by... Appreciate it. Moving on. Um, yeah, so I really like their videos because they're doing in their videos basically what we're doing in this class, which is... There's one story in scripture, right? so let's try to figure out what that one story is. Uh, but I really like that, that specific video for our conversation here because we're talking about Eden and what's lost in Eden and how that's going to come back, right? So what Jesus is going to accomplish is Eden again, right? It's not like the image shows, uh, you know, you're going to just leave our space and go to God's space, right? But rather God's space and our space will finally fully overlap again, just like they didn't need. Right. Does that make sense? You guys track with me here? Yeah? Okay. Let's take like five minutes and maybe like go run some laps or something for some of you that are falling asleep right now. Um, and, uh, and we'll come back in about two o'clock.